Have you ever had the experience where you're on a journey home from somewhere, traveling across country or whatever the case may be, and as you near a certain point, as you pass certain way markers, you finally get that sense, we are coming home. For me, living in the town of Whangarei in the far north of New Zealand, the North Island of, the nor of New Zealand, whenever I travel from down south, we would come up over a, a, a sort of a mountain pass, a big set of hills, which were called the Branduins. And as you crested over the top of the hill and you look down into the Whangarei Harbour, there you could see the whole layout of the land. And it was at that point, although we were still half an hour or 40 minutes away from home in terms of being at our front door, you had that sense that wherever you had come from down south, as you crested that hill and saw the landscape before you, ah, we're home. Or maybe you've been in an aeroplane. And when you're traveling from one place to the next, you'll, you know what it's like. You take off and you've got hours and hours and hours in the airplane. And, and you can lose track of time and how long you've been in the air. And then eventually certain things start to happen. Like, for instance, uh, the last meal is served. And then the waitresses and the hostesses, they come down the aisles and they start to collect all the rubbish. And then the, those little custom cards get handed out and you start searching frantically for a pen to be able to fill out the customs card in advance and the angle of the plane starts to change and you feel the descent beginning to happen. And then as you get still closer, perhaps the seatbelt light comes on and, and the final seatbelt check is done. And then eventually, even after that, you'll notice that the, the air hostesses and hosts, they, they take their seats and they buckle in. And then a little while after that, you, you hear the, the bump and the groan of the wheels beginning to drop down from below the undercarriage and you know that now you are almost there you're about to touch down there are these signs and there's these way marks along the way in the journey that tell you that the end of the journey is near or as children growing up right looking forward to Chris Christmas so many of us used to used to really really anticipate Christmas Day and the joy that it would bring the family time and not to forget the gifts right and as and as that time draws near you know you're almost there not only because it's been January February March and April but somewhere around October November you start to see decorations going up in stores you start to hear Christmas songs on the radio and when you are shopping in store the Christmas specials start to be advertised and then the closer you get to the day the more frantic it becomes right the more desperate and urgent the busier town is and the more the, the more traffic increases and you know that that day is coming and then finally on Christmas Day everybody arrives a town goes dead and Christmas Day is celebrated you see as we as human beings we have this experience of journeys we have this experience of of being able to to track how close we are to our final destination by the events that are taking place around us. The urgency of the times are determined by the signs that indicate that we are in those last moments before this event or this arrival takes place. Well, Jesus spoke to the people of his day and used a parable. It's a brief one verse parable and it goes like this. We find it in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 32. It says, Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is, that, that he is near right at the door. Jesus is talking about his own return here. Jesus is saying that the glorious anticipation that every believer in Jesus Christ has, that glorious anticipation of face to face with Jesus, we do not know the time or the hour exactly, but we do know the season that it is near the end. And to illustrate this, he uses an object lesson from nature, the budding of a fig tree, right? It's interesting to me that uh, numerous times, in fact, every season, I will know that spring is coming even while winter is still in the air. And I know that because when I'm wandering through my garden, wearing my heavy jacket, feeling that wintry ski field blast of wind that's coming from the deep south somewhere, when, I, when I'm feeling that and there's no, there's no tangible 
uh, no tangible evidence in my body that the season is changing. It's dark, it's overcast, it's rainy, it's windy, it's cold. All of those typical indicators of winter are still present. As I'm wandering through my garden, inevitably some tree somewhere will have the first indications that life is returning. The season of the resurrection is coming. Uh, spring is dawning, not because I can feel it, but because there's something about these trees, there's something about these shrubs, there's something about the fruit trees that are, th their buds are coming out. The, the blossoms are coming on, even although it's still cold. It's the first indication to me that the season is changing. And Jesus latched onto this and he said that, that illustration tells you that you can know more or less when Jesus is coming. You can know that it is soon. You can sense the urgency of the times by a bunch of things that will be happening. And in Matthew chapter 24 before and in Matthew 24 after the parable, a whole lot of these signs are indicated. When we go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 or 1st, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we, we, we see more of these signs that are unfolding. We find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 some signs that are unfolding. We read in Revelation chapter 13 some of the prophetic signs that will be unfolding. And so what I want to do with you today is I want to, I want to unpack this. Jesus says, in agriculture, you know the change of season is coming, not because you can always feel it in your body, but because you can look at the signs around you in the natural world. You can see it in the blossoms that the trees are getting, that the season is underway. Change is coming. The season of resurrection is near. And what an appropriate, what an appropriate idea that when we think of the second coming of Jesus, which we know is associated with the resurrection of the faithful, that we can think of springtime as the season of resurrection for plants, well, so too the coming of Jesus is, is springtime or the season of resurrection for the faithful. And there are signs that we are nearing that point in time. Now, I, I want to highlight here that in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus himself makes it very plain in verse 36, that of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like in the days of Noah. Jesus says, you can know the season is approaching, but anybody who dares to set a date, whether that is a specific date, like the 24th of August 2025, or whether it is a soft sort of a date, like somewhere between now and 2027, for instance, some soft date setting or some specific date setting, Jesus rules that out. There is no way to know those specifics. But what he does say is you can know that the times are urgent. You can know that we're approaching the event. You can know that you are now closer than when you were back there because certain things have unfolded now that haven't yet unfolded back there. He says we can know that we're on the journey. We've crested the hill. We can see the glorious kingdom in the valley there. We're not quite there yet, but we know it's on the horizon. We know we're about to touch down in the kingdom of God because the wheels have unfolded from the undercarriage. We know that the glorious day we're looking forward to is almost here because the song is in the air, because the frantic pace of society is picking up. So I want to run through with you some of those signs, bearing in mind that no one should proclaim a specific date or even a narrow sort of range of dates that we would consider soft time setting. Jesus is clear about that. No one knows the specifics, but we do know that the season is fast changing. And the very first place to start is what Jesus says here. The Son of Man, when He comes, it will be just like the days of Noah. As in those days which were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, they were marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. He says here, people will be engrossed with their everyday lives. People will be carrying on oblivious to the times. Why? Because although the fig tree has budded, no one's paying attention to the fig tree. The signs are there and the first warning that Jesus gives is be attentive. 
That is the reason Jesus tells this parable. That is the reason he uses this analogy. Because he knows that it is so easy to become caught up in the normal everyday things of life. Raising families, engaging in relationships, doing things that are not bad in themselves. None of these things are bad. They're eating, they're drinking, they're carrying on. They're preoccupied with this earthly life. Jesus says the greatest danger to not being prepared is that you and I don't make time to consider spiritual things. We are carrying on being good citizens, being good husbands and wives, raising great children, uh, uh, you know, providing for the family, carrying on with normal everyday things. And we're not pausing to remember that time is headed somewhere. That we're on a trajectory. There's an intersection up ahead between this world and the kingdom of God. And our time down here, the most significant aspect of our time down here, ought to be devoted to preparing for that eternal kingdom. Making sure that we are citizens today, here, now, that we may be citizens in the kingdom when it finally arrives in all its glory. Jesus was the beginning, the original seed, the ushering in of the kingdom of God, and it will culminate in his second return when we will once again be face to face with Jesus. This is my hope. This is something I hope that you will be hoping for, anticipating, living towards. And listen to that description, living towards. We are on a journey. We are going somewhere. The whole of history is headed in a direction. And the, the, the great warning here is that the world before the coming of Jesus will be like it was in the time of Noah. Noah preached a message. He gave a warning. It took 120 years to build that ark. 120 years of God's probation, of God's grace, of God's mercy. 120 years of proclaiming the flood was coming. You must prepare. You must get into the ark that you may be saved. But you know what? Because God was gracious, because it took a while, because people had never seen something like that happen before, they looked at Noah and they said, you're a crazy old man. So we're going to carry on with our everyday life because this is all there is. Jesus says one of the signs of the last days is that same attitude of spiritual carelessness and neglect. That same spirit of tomorrow's another day. That same sense that there's nothing beyond this world. That same round of activity. Not bad in and of itself. But when it eclipses eternal realities and causes us to neglect the time of preparation and neglect the message of warning, when we write it off because it's taken so long, it's going to be forever, maybe it's never going to happen, that attitude is one of the signs of the last days. When you go to the beginning of Matthew chapter 24, you will read this, this warning. It says here, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. But see that you're not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. That was verse 6. Verse 7 says, For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. You know what Jesus is saying here? Yeah, war has always been with us. Earthquakes have always been with us. Famines have always been with us. In another place, Jesus even said, and the poor will be with you to the end of the age. There's this idea that the world has been broken by sin. As a result of that brokenness and the, the, the effect that sin has had upon this planet, everything is in a state of degradation. Our physical bodies are dying from the day we're born. Happy thought, right? It's this idea that, 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 that although we, we consider ourselves young and we're growing and we're in the prime of life, we're actually on a gradual path of descent. We live in a world that is politically on edge all the time. Rumors of wars and actual wars. There are riots in the streets. There is breakdown of society and of the family unit. And we'll talk about that later on. All of these things are signs of decay. And Jesus says, now listen, there are some of these signs. There are some of these signs that have been around forever. So be careful you don't make too much of them. Be careful you don't make too much of wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilence and all the rest of it. Be careful, he says, these are just the beginning of the birth pains. Now in saying that, he's highlighting something. On the one hand, some things are with us all the time. 
there are going to be other signs that are definitive marks that we are getting towards the end. But some of these signs are general and are simply a sign of, of, of decay through the ages. But he does make this analogy and say they're birth pains. And when you think of a, la a, a woman in labor, you realize that the, there, there is an inkling that this baby is going to come with the first cramp, with the first pain. But as time progresses, those very things that were there earlier on increase in frequency and intensity. So too with the wars, the rumors of wars, the pestilence, the political, uh, living on the political knife's edge, we realize when we look at our world that it seems that as we have globalized, as we've become a global village, that these, that these, instead of this bringing an age of peace, a utopian glory, in essence, we have more trouble now than we've ever had before. What happens in one place affects the whole world. Think about a worldwide pandemic. Think about, think about a worldwide economy and what happens in one superpower uh, country, how it affects the rest of the world. We are now, as it were, all in it together. There's no more layers of insulation. We rise together and we fall together. We have peace together and we have war together. Think of the world wars that have come up, uh, upon this planet. Like nothing seen in previous ages where all we had was swords, bows, and arrows, and the like. You see, we, as time progresses, as technology progresses, as the world globalizes, we realize the truth of this, that some of these signs have been there all the way through because they're actually simply the signs or the decay, the evidence of sin in our world. But they intensify. They, 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 they become more rapid and more frequent. This is the world we live in. Jesus goes on to, to say, uh, he speaks about signs in the religious world, tribulation. They'll deliver you to tribulation. They will kill you. They will, you'll be hated by all nations on account of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and will deliver up one another and hate one another. Now, before I explain that any further, I must say here that in Matthew 24, it begins where the disciples ask Jesus. Because Jesus says, a time is coming when the temple of Jerusalem will be, will be destroyed. And the disciples thinking that the only time that could possibly happen to this grand and glorious building, the only time that God would allow that to happen to this, this chosen nation of God, must be the end of the age. So they ask Jesus a single question, which they think is one question, but is actually two questions. And the question is, tell us when will these things happen? You know, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And what will be the sign of the coming uh, end of the age? They think to themselves, this must all be one thing. And Jesus answers both those questions, which are actually different in the space of time chronologically, but he answers what the end of the world will be like by describing what will happen in Jerusalem and Judea when the fall of Jerusalem happens in 70 AD. And so Jerusalem, with the people of God, the capital city of God at that time, becomes a microcosm of what will happen at the end of time on a global level scale for all the people of God. And so Jesus speaks here about how there will be wars and rumors of wars, literally for the Jews and for the Ju Judaic nation, right? Then he speaks about how they will be persecuted and handed over to courts because of their faith, especially those new, uh, uh, those new Christians, right, that, that, that came out of Judaism. And, and this is a sign of what will happen at the end. It should come as no surprise then that when you read Revelation chapter 13, at the end of Scripture, which speaks specifically about the last days and the final struggle between the powers of good and the powers of evil just before the coming of Jesus. It should come as no surprise then that we read prophetically that that same thing will happen in the future. It says here in verse 16, He causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. He provides that no one should be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. You see, I'm not going to get into what all of that means. I don't have time to do that. The mark of the beast and the, the beasts of Revelation. I'm not going to get into that. All I'm going to say to you is that Revelation 13, speaking in a last day context, echoes what Jesus says to the early disciples. There is another age of persecution coming upon the church, which is hard to believe when we're living in an age of freedom, right? Now, I realize that at all times, believers around the world, even now, are suffering persecution. But Revelation tells about a satanic plot in the last days that will have a global impact of global reach. 
that will again persecute those who choose to live faithfully with the Word of God. Like what happened during the Middle Ages. Like what happened when Christianity fought against Christianity. Believer persecuting believer because they felt, some believers felt, that other believers were apostate and were a threat to the kingdom of God. Once again, in a global scale, Revelation 13 tells us that that will be one of the quintessential signs just before the coming of Jesus. So we have some general signs. We have some general signs that will become more intense and more frequent. We have some signs in the religious world that are very specific to, 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 to what will happen just before the coming of Jesus, such as that final global age of persecution. Coming back to Matthew 24, it says here there will be false prophets that will arise, that will mislead many. And so we, re we realize that there will be the, the aspect of false teaching, that you can't believe everything that is taught by someone claiming to believe the Word of God or said to you by someone claiming to be a Christian. You have to test it for yourself against the Word of God. Satan is not afraid to infiltrate the church. Satan is not afraid to influence the church, to turn, as it were, the church that's supposed to be the bastion of truth and righteousness in the world, turn it into something that misleads. And you know what? He did that very successfully down through the Middle Ages, where the mainstream church of God, the one that was, that was the early church that grew into this grand global church, as it were, uh, the, the church of Rome, it became the apostate church. Satan hijacked it and turned it to his purposes. He hid the teachings of the Word of God under tradition. He hid it under church politics. He hid it under, under customs and practices that were not rooted in the Word of God. He, he hid the beautiful truth of righteousness by faith under this layer of, of the church being the source of grace that, that you were saved through fellowship and, and, and belonging to the church, that the church mediated the grace of Christ through the sacraments. And so if you weren't connected with the church of God, you couldn't be saved, right? Which is why the kings of Europe feared above all else the Pope. Why? Because the, if the Pope excommunicated them and their nation, they were doomed to hell forever and for eternity, right? And so there was this incredible power that religious leaders had even over the political state such that the political state led its might and its power of force to the religious institution, the church, to enforce its dogmas, to persecute those who disagreed with it. You see, the church of the Middle Ages is the epitome of a hijacked church, overtaken by Satan, uh, proclaiming to be the representatives of God on earth, proclaiming to be the teachers of God on earth, proclaiming to be the way of salvation on earth, but completely misrepresenting the character and the heart of God, the nature of the plan of salvation by grace through faith, completely using force instead of the power of the Spirit to change hearts and to persuade, employing the power of the, of the force of state to persecute those who would disagree with her teachings, her dogmas, and her practices. You see, all of these things Jesus foretold as being signs that would tell us we were nearing the end. So if you've ever struggled with the injustices of the, the story of the Christian church down through the ages, understand that Jesus actually foretold these things in advance, which doesn't make it okay or all right, but it does tell you that perhaps the reason Satan has sought to hijack the church and misrepresent God on earth is precisely because he knows that there is truth there. There is a true representation there. There is a true way of salvation there. And therefore, that must be his object to obfuscate. He, he must devote his time and his attention to, to making the church lose its credibility and misrepresent God. So don't lose heart and think to yourself, oh, let's just chuck this religion thing, this church thing out the door. No, it's one of the signs in the religious world that we are nearing the coming of Jesus. It goes on to say here, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Are we not living in a world like that today? We're not living in a world where, where people take advantage of the kindness of people. You know, they, they stage things like a breakdown on the side of the road so that they can hijack the, the person who means well, who comes to their rescue. 
Do, do we not live in a world where people seek to, to, to scam well-meaning people out of their financial gain? Do we not live in a world where crime seems to prevail and, and injustice doesn't always seem to be made right? And because of that, people become more insular, more distrusting. It's a natural protection mechanism, but it's one of the signs that we are nearing the end. Jesus then goes on in verse 13 to say, but the one who endures to the end shall be saved. And you know what I think that means? Not just the one who claws himself to the end, but, but the one who endures to the end. The context is talking about love growing cold because of the nastiness of this world. The one who endures in the spirit of love, the one who endures in the spirit of, of service, the one who is willing to, to, to take the risk of being taken advantage of to seek and to save and to serve. The one who endures to the end with the spirit and this character of Jesus, despite the coldness of the world, the one who endures in the spirit shall be saved. And then verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a witness to all the nations, then the end shall come. Friend, I wanna, I wanna emphasize this is the quintessential sign. This is the wheels on the bottom of the plane, you know, telling you that you are about to land. The fact that we are living in a day and an age. Yes, there is still work to be done for the kingdom of God. We haven't quite reached the end, but we are living in a day and an age now where the gospel is going to the whole world through radio, through television, through personal effort, through missionary endeavor, uh, through service in local communities, you name it. The gospel is going to the whole world world. And if, and if you think it's not, you may be amongst those who are so caught up that we we're speaking about earlier on, like in the times of Noah, so caught up in the everyday activities that either you're not participating in being a part of the gospel going out, or you're so distracted that you're not seeing it happen around you. The quintessential sign that this plane is about to land on the runway of the kingdom of God is that this gospel is going out to all the world. When we jump over to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul picks up on the sentiment of Jesus. He says, Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you, need, you have need of nothing to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they're saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. When Jesus talks about the thief element, he's talking about the timing. He's talking about the fact that those who are not watching will be caught surprised. If you are watching, it's not going to catch you by surprise. You will, you will see the season chaining. You will see the buds on that fig tree, right? And so you do not need to be caught unaware. Paul and Jesus plead with us through the word of God saying, pay attention, sit up, Take notice, be of sober mind, because the end is nearing. The signs are fulfilling. The, the, the buds on the fig tree, spiritually speaking, are transpiring. When we go a little bit further, we have a look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. It says, the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Again, highlighting the sign in the spiritual world. You can't always believe everything just because of appearance. You've got to test it for yourself by the Word of God. You've got to analyze it. When you go over a page or two and you look at 2 Timothy, you will find here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 1, it says, realize this that in the last days difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious, gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power and avoid such men as these. Doesn't that sound like the world we live in? How many times have there been scandals in the Christian community, in the church, by great preachers of the word? How many times have people been caught out living one life or teaching, proclaiming one life while they're actually living a second life, a double life? How many times have that, has that brought disrepute upon religion, upon Christianity, upon the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, as, 
as tragic as that is, and, and especially because some will be led to cast away their faith, saying, there's no power in this thing. Jesus has identified that one of the signs of the last days. It was present in his time in the religious community. It's present in our times. Do not lose heart in the message and in the God of the message because the messenger is failing, because the messenger proves to be a hypocrite. Consider whether the message is true. Our lives should give credibility to what we say. It should indeed. But at times... We have to look strictly at the message and at the merits of the one who gives the message, as in the king of the message, and not the messenger he, he sends. Jesus said one of the signs of the last days will be religiosity, will be, will be uh, this, this external veneer of spirituality, and yet we live as those who are unconverted. We live as those who are this list of things over here. It's interesting to me that when you consider some of the mental health diagnoses in our world today, uh, things like oppositional defiance disorder and the like, I often think to myself, isn't that label, isn't that diagnosis really simply an acknowledgement of sin in the world? Isn't that simply an extreme uh, in a world that doesn't want to acknowledge spirituality? Isn't that simply what the Bible would call rebellion? The lack of conversion, the desire to live in my own way, to not be accountable to anyone, to live selfishly. When I look at this list here in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, I realize it describes our times. I realize it matches with some of the mental health diagnoses. And I'm not saying to you that there's no legitimacy to mental health diagnoses. I'm just saying that some of these labels that we now think are medical conditions have their root in a spiritual condition of alienation from God. And the true ultimate healing is found only as we choose to reconcile with God. Listen carefully to me. I want you to understand that we are living in the last days. We are living in, in times and in seasons that tell us the end is near. The kingdom of God in all its glory is about to return with Jesus Christ as King of Kings and, of Law, and as Lord of Lords. My question is, are you paying attention? Have you made the choice yet to surrender to this king? That's what this life is about. That's what the short time on earth is for. Primarily, that you would decide whether God is worth giving your allegiance to for all of eternity. Whether you It's for you to decide whether you will surrender your life, your will, and your purpose to his heart and to his will. This life is not about the earthly kingdom building. It is about heavenly kingdom building. This life is the one chance and the only chance that you and I have to decide whether we will love the God who has so loved us that he has come into this world to lay down his life for our redemption. The signs are fast fulfilling. The buds on the fig tree, metaphorically speaking, are abundant. The leaves are coming out. Spring is here. The season of the resurrection is coming. This plane of human journeying is about to land on the runway of the kingdom of God. The wheels are folding out from beneath it. Are you aware? Are you conscious? Are you paying attention? Are you hand in hand with the king of the kingdom? Don't delay making the choice to surrender your heart and life to Jesus. Let me pray with you. Father in heaven, for the person who hears this teaching, who, who understands and who comes under the conviction of the Holy Spirit based on the Word of God, I pray, Lord, that you would arouse an excitement within them that soon and very soon we will see the King. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to endure to the end with the Spirit of Jesus in a dark and cold world, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to give our, uh, our resources, our efforts, our skills, our energy to growing this kingdom of God, to proclaiming this message, to giving this invitation to those of our family, our friends, our acquaintances who still need to hear it. I pray, Lord, that you'd make us effective for the kingdom of God, that you'd enthuse us with the soon arrival of the glorious kingdom of God, and that you would help us to live faithfully, 
with the love and the Spirit of Jesus in this cold world. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.